So Catherine is uh, co-director of the Nottingham Centre for Evidence-Based Healthcare, a Joanna Briggs Institute Centre of Excellence in the UK, in Welsh. <laughs> uh, and she's a nurse and an associate professor in the School of Health Sciences and is passionate about improving healthcare through evidence-based practice. Floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just put my timer on here. Right, so um, yes, good morning and um, you know, thank you for, for um, inviting me to speak today. And I think this presentation um, probably follows on quite well from the previous one. Because I'm, uh -huh, sorry, okay, yeah, because I'm going to be talking about um, how to establish confidence in the findings of qualitative evidence syntheses, qualitative systematic reviews. And there's currently two uh, processes available for this, one that is uh, recommended by JBI called CONQUEL, and one that has been derived from the Cochrane Qualitative and Implementation Methods Group called CIRQUEL. And I'm going to be talking to you about um, my experiences of using these approaches, um, and I'll be using an exemplar systematic review that I've recently conducted to talk through some of the issues and challenges that we encountered doing this, and I'll come up with some uh, recommendations for future research <coughs> in this area. Okay, and the review that I'm going to be talking about to illustrate some of the points that I want to make um, is a review around um, care of women and girls who've experienced female genital mutilation or cutting, which I'm going to abbreviate to FGM. Uh, it was a qualitative systematic review funded by the UK NIHR, and it aimed to explore the experiences of accessing and receiving healthcare related to FGM in OECD countries. And it was a qualitative systematic review using a thematic synthesis approach and NVivo software, but I utilized the JBI critical appraisal tool, JBI Quarry, and we applied um, our assessment of confidence, used the grade CIRQUEL approach, but I also then retrospectively went back and applied CONQUEL to the findings to enable you know, some sort of comparison to be made, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It was quite a large review for a qualitative review in the sense that it included um, 57 studies and we came up with 17 descriptive themes, five analytical themes and a conceptual model as the outputs. Okay, so before I talk about um, what we actually did in the review and some of the issues and challenges around um, assessing these, the level of confidence, I'll just talk about the different approaches that are currently being used. So uh, the Joanna Briggs Institute has published an approach called uh, uh, CONQUEL, sorry, um, to establish uh, confidence in review findings. And confidence <coughs> here is defined um, as the belief or trust that a person can place in the results of uh, the research. And they use two different concepts, dependability and credibility. So dependability is akin to uh, reliability, and it evaluates whether the process of the research um, undertaken has been logical, traceable, clearly documented, um, and particularly looks at the methods chosen and the decisions made by the researchers. So it relates to methodological quality very fundamentally. Uh, credibility is the second related concept. This is more akin to um, internal validity. And this is more about evaluating the congruence uh, between the author's interpretation and the supporting data that is given. So it considers whether the findings uh, of a study authentically and comprehensively reflect the phenomenon of interest. And um, Clive Seal has got a concept called a concept indicator fit, and the credibility is very akin to this. So it's a global evaluation, really, of the fit between the primary data and the author's, or in this case, the reviewer's interpretations. Uh, and within the JVI approach, um, there's different ways of, of um, assessing dependability and credibility. Uh, and I'll just talk through those respectively. So dependability um, is assessed by looking at five key questions which are found on the JBI uh, critical appraisal tool, JBI Quarry. They have um, determined that five of those, that of, there are 10 questions on the tool, and they've determined that five of those relate very specifically to this concept of dependability. Um, and the way that they establish then a study's uh, dependability sort of rating uh, within a review finding is to, to see um, 
whether for each individual study you can answer you know, yes or no to those five particular questions, three of which relate to the congruence between the sort of methodology and methods and analysis, and two relate very specifically to reflexivity, that is the author's own philosophical and theoretical standpoint, and the transparentness and sort of openness with which they have reported the decisions that they've made um, throughout their research and how their own perspectives may have influenced their interpretations. Um, credibility, on the other hand, um, is focused on uh, the findings that are extracted from an individual study. And here JBI um, recommends that for each finding that is um, extracted from any one study, it's given a rating. Um, from unequivocal, where it's very well grounded and well supported and explained um, in the paper, to credible, where um, there's an element perhaps of, of doubt. It looks looks like it fits, but you know that it's not really well explained. To unsupported, where the author may have made an interpretation, it's not really clear um, where that was derived from. And depending on which of those um, ratings a finding is given. Um, uh, the review finding could be downgraded from high to very low. <clears throat> Grade Circle is the um, uh, uh, Cochrane Qualitative uh, Methods and Implementation Group's process, and they've recently published um, in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology a series of seven papers outlining this approach. Um, but so, by contrast, rather than looking just at two domains, they are looking now at four, although actually when CERQOL was initially developed, they also only looked at two to begin with, and it's expanded over um, a period of methodological development and testing. Um, so they've got four components. Um, so the first is methodological limitations, and that is the extent to which you know, you know, there are problems perhaps in the design or conduct of the primary study. Um, there's relevance. That's the extent to which the body of evidence um, is relevant to the particular context or population specified in the review question. There's coherence, and that's the extent to which um, the patterns found in the data are well grounded and, um, and consistent in explaining a particular phenomenon of interest. And there's adequacy, which relates to the kind of richness or depth of the findings of the data and, um, and the sort of numbers of papers perhaps supporting a, a particular theme. They also have a fifth domain, dissemination bias, but that's still under development. We don't have guidance yet on how that might be established for qualitative reviews. And within each of those, so for each review finding, uh, you make an assessment in, um, in those five, in those four domains. Uh, ranging from no concerns, minor, moderate, serious, and um, taking your assessments across the four domains, you make a final judgment as to whether that review finding is high confidence, moderate confidence, or low confidence. Okay, um, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, so comparing the two approaches, you can see that um, we have dependability and credibility for Conquell. We have uh, the four different domains for Serquell. Um, I think dependability is very similar to the methodological limitations in CERQOL. Credibility relates quite closely, um, not exactly the same, but closely to coherence and adequacy. There isn't really a relevance element to um, CONQOL, and we'll, as we go on, we'll see whether or not that's important. Okay, so for the review that um, I'm going to use as my example on FGM, um, I'll talk through the assessments we made for the review findings. And I'm going to take as the review findings the 17 descriptive themes as they most closely link to the sort of direct findings from the data and haven't gone through multiple processes of interpretation. And that's what Serquel recommends. Um, so looking at uh, methodological limitations then. So in Conquell, this is defined as dependability. Um, so out of the 57 studies that we included, um, only 12 of them would have been rated as good. The majority would have been downgraded one or two levels um, because of not being able to answer yes to those key five questions that, that um, are said to constitute criteria of dependability. So there would have been considerable downgrading across all of our studies um, for that. Looking at methodological limitations for CERQOL, uh, this is more challenging because the guidance suggests that we don't sort of um, 
rate or rank studies, um, and we don't score them, but rather we look at studies um, for each individual review finding and uh, make a judgment on what the particular methodological flaws were for each individual study, and then what impact collectively that might have had on your review finding. And because every review finding is different and every review finding has different studies underpinning it, um, it's a very kind of lengthy process. Um, and we found with 57 studies that we needed some way of giving ourselves at least a broad indication of relative quality. So without wanting to score papers, we ranked them into quality bands where um, using an approach sort of previously published, um, that I'm not going to go into here, we um, ranked papers that scored above seven on the JBI quarry tool as high quality, that scored between five to seven as medium, and that, that scored below five as low. So that just gave us a very broad brush kind of indication of relative quality. So using that approach, um, over 50% of our studies would have been considered high quality. So this is quite different to the Conquell assessment. Um, 21 were medium and only 6% were considered low. Um, but because each of our review findings had a mix of studies with different ratings, we did in the end decide to downgrade all of them to moderate, moderate concerns. Um, but this whole process threw up a number of conceptual issues, um, which was about using checklists to rate quality of qualitative research. It's quite well known that checklists often measure um, the quality of reporting rather than the quality of the studies themselves. And um, when we looked sort of at our studies um, for the Conquell, we found that only nine studies, sorry, only 9% of studies, so only five out of 57, uh, had actually reported on every element of the dependability criteria. Um, so that had a huge impact on downgrading all of them. And 60% of our studies didn't mention uh, reflexivity at all, so quest the two of the questions. So they were just automatically downgraded. Whereas we know that for qualitative research, that um, it's very difficult in journal word limits to sort of reflect much on the reflexivity element. Likewise, 10 studies hadn't reported anything about ethical approval, but we know that they had um, followed what seemed to be a perfectly ethical approach. So we did find that there's, there's more work to be done here on, on the distinguishing quality of reporting versus the quality, really, of the findings. Um, with Conquell, uh, looking at, so, uh, at sort of um, conceptual challenges still, Conquell was easier because once a, a study had been rated, on dependability, that rating stays fixed, whereas CERQUAL does require you to make an assessment for every single new review finding. Um, we also found it very hard to make a judgment when we had a very large number of studies underpinning each of our review findings. Uh, all of them had between 19 to 46 underpinning studies with varying quality rankings. So then you, you, you know, how do you decide? Do you take the average, do you take the majority? Uh, do you take those that seem to be most significant and important? Um, it was quite a difficult process, and it's one that certainly for the Conquell process needs more guidance on um, what, how to make that judgment, and it is ultimately a matter of judgment. Um, okay, for assessment of credibility in Conquell, um, our, all of our review findings were a mix of unequivocal and credible, but we did have some that were unsupported. Um, so, again, all of our findings would have been downgraded by at least one or two levels. Um, but nonetheless, it was hard to make that judgment. Do you take uh, the Conquell guidance is quite clear cut on this, but we found it much more difficult, particularly when we had a large number of review findings. For CERQUAL, uh, the two elements that relate to credibility are coherence and adequacy. So, for coherence, we looked at the underpinning data for each theme. We looked to see whether they were consistent across contexts, populations. So did it apply just to maternity settings or other settings? Was it a very clear pattern that was emerging? Um, although we did find that, again, that slightly went against the ethos of qualitative research where you're actually looking for the disconfirming case where, where heterogeneity is very illuminating where it exists. And we were able to, to rate our, our findings um, accordingly. But again, that was quite a time-consuming process. Adequacy, this relates something like theoretical saturation, but we, we had to determine the, the richness and depth of the data as well as 
the, uh, whether we had a lot of data sort of that supported different findings. And for that, we looked at you know, the number of studies underpinning each theme, but we also used um, an approach that's been used by Jenny Pope et al. before to classify our studies as thick or thin, depending on how grounded they were in the data and how explanatory, but I can't go into that all here. Um, but again, um, so it was quite easy to make this judgment when we had 46 out of 57 studies all supporting a review finding. But again, I think we need to be cautious not to apply a quantitative logic when making these distinctions. <clears throat> Relevance. This is um, how relevant the underpinning data is to the context specified in the review question. So our question was about um, care for women and girls. Um, who'd had FGM in healthcare settings, all healthcare settings. So what we'd have been looking for here is, you know, is the data only applicable to you know, one particular healthcare setting, maternity? Would that also be applicable to primary care? Is the other studies about Somali women also applicable to studies of women from other East African countries or other parts of the world? So that's the sort of assessment that we had to make there. Um, but that was quite a straightforward process ultimately. Um, but time-consuming as well. So, um, in terms of our overall assessment of confidence in the review findings, we found that using the two different approaches gave us different assessments of confidence. Um, now, of course, making these assessments of confidence is nonetheless still a matter of judgment by the whole review team, but we, um, we did come up with differences. So, Conquell, uh, we would have rated all of our findings as moderate. None could have been rated high. Um, whereas with Serqual, we rated 10 of our findings as high confidence and seven as moderate. Does this matter? <laughs> that's, that's one of the key questions, really, that I think we need to uh, explore in further research. So um, just to sort of sum up and conclude, um, there are differences between the two approaches available right now. Um, Conqual looks at two domains, Serqual assesses four. Conqual definitely is quicker and easier to apply. It appears a bit more formulaic right now, the way the guidance is formulated. It doesn't leave much room at all for judgment and discussion and debate and explanation of those decisions. Um, there's more room for nuance and um, I think, uh, at the moment, using the Serqual domains. Um, but having said that, there's not a lot of sort of guidance out there yet on Conqual, and perhaps we could do with some worked examples. Um, for both approaches, it was difficult to, because we had such a large number of studies, um, which meant really it, it added a huge amount of time um, to our systematic review process, and that's something that really needs to be factored in. <coughs> And also the um, software, like Summary, for example, the JBR software isn't set up yet to facilitate making these sort of assessments. So it's something that you have to develop your own system for. Um, for both approaches, whilst, um, whilst I feel that um, clearly for um, using qualitative reviews for guideline development, it is essential to have an assessment of confidence in those findings. Um, I think there's still work to be done in the sense of um, how to avoid this process for qualitative reviews becoming too quantitative, starting to um, you know, apply scores and sums and aggregates and uh, you know, figure out whether it's the majority or the average. or you know, it, it goes against the sort of interpretive ethos to a large extent of, of the significance of findings in particular contexts. And um, as our friend Einstein said, not everything that counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And I think we do have to be very careful um, not to um, you know, allow the qualitative evidence paradigm to become too subsumed into um, the quantitative paradigm in this domain. So I think for future research, um, I think we need more research um, doing something similar to what I've just done, perhaps comparing the two different approaches with different teams and different reviews um, and trying to get a sense of, you know, would different teams have come up with the same sorts of outcomes as we did? To what extent is judgment still playing a part here? 
Um, it would be useful to look at the relative impact of different quality assessment tools on those confidence ratings. So for Conquell, you have to use the JBI Quarry tool. You can't use other tools at the moment. CERQOL is much more flexible. You can use any tool. Um, but in fact, the CERQOL group are, are undertaking a process of methodological development of trying to find a tool or develop a tool that would more easily facilitate you to be able to make the assessments that we've just been talking about. So I think there's um, a lot of work that still needs to be done there. And then research on actually how user-friendly and understandable these kind of confidence assessments are for guideline developers, which is what um, Kay was talking about before. What impact are they having? How much are they actually looked at, understood, and how are they made sense of, especially when you combine them with the quantitative review findings? Um, we really don't know anything about that at all yet. How to assess confidence in mixed methods reviews. That's an area that's open for research. And how to assess confidence in more theoretical review output. So if you were doing a meta-ethnography, for example, or taking a more analytical and interpretive approach, how would you um, apply these assessments to that approach? OK, I've got lots of references here for anyone who's interested. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> in time, okay. <laughs> uh, better than me with the microphone. Okay. So do we have some questions to Katrin? Yes, Kay. Please. I can probably shout, but so how did you do that? Because we've done a similarly quite big qualitative JBI review. This is a horrible microphone. Mm -hmm. um, how did you do that thing of once you've got your, if you've got a mix of different types of findings, how did you decide whether to downgrade or not? Um, well, on the whole, I mean, we looked at each individual study and, and the findings and ultimately made an assessment on what the majority of the studies were. And pointing I suppose that's towards. my question. How do we, so, or is it right? And what is the majority? Yeah. That's... And, and for qualitative research, this is where I'm cautioning against using our quantitative logic, because if you have, just as an example, 10 studies, and two of them really, really clearly and strongly indicate a particular finding, and the others are weak studies, but sort of support it, would you then completely downgrade it? Or would you, you know, these are questions that are open for debate. Yeah. I, interest. I just wondered mm -hmm. if you, how you got around that. But right. I, I well, we, well, we found that ultimately we had to use our judgment and expertise. But, uh, but this is what I'm saying. I think other teams may have reached other conclusions. And that's where we need to... A lot more research, I think, is needed in this for, for how we apply these. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more question, but I will give you the better mic behind you, Kay. It's And that was really interesting, and it's an ongoing debate, isn't it, with these uh, conqual and circqual and how you rate. One of the big issues we found as well, certainly with qualitative work, is that what you can publish is such a minor mm. version of what you actually have. And I know that's probably an issue in quantitative as well, but certainly with quality, there's often lots of data. And one of the examples you gave was of the ethical issues, wasn't it? And often you just mm. can't, it's clear they've had ethical permission, but you can't report it. I just wondered what your thoughts are with that when we're rating qualitative evidence, but we're only rating what's in the journal. We're not actually rating the actual report for full and all the full data. Yeah, I mean, I think um, yeah, this will all making these sort of judgments will become easier as as journals are forcing authors to adhere to like the correct guidelines, for example, in in the way they write up their reports. But the problem for that is. Um, is that you may then, and what we do already get, is a lot of um, studies that are, are procedurally well reported, but might be um, very unilluminating in terms of the problems that you want to explore. Maybe they're giving more time in the paper to the procedural aspects, and the actual findings section has to be very truncated as a result. Um, I don't really know what the answer is to that. Um, <laughs> Open, a open access journals and, and um, you know, with their sort of more generous p word limits are, are perhaps one, you know, one way or 
um, pointing people back to the original PhD theses, for example. Um, yeah, it's, it's a conundrum. <laughs>